<laughs> so we thought that um, maybe for this um, ALBA meeting, it would be um, interesting to talk about something topical, like how actually the COVID uh, pandemic has changed how we work uh, and do our research um, in academia and how that actually spe specifically impacts women and uh, minority groups. Um, talked about the questions. And so um, these are um, the ALBA ambassadors um, that were willing um, to join for this. Um, the first, uh, Carmen Sandy, um, the chair of the ALBA network and professor at the EPFL in Switzerland and um, president or past president of FENS. Um, then um, Diane Lipscomb, Brown University. She actually is the chair of the data working group. And I think very importantly, how we need to actually be data driven um, to move things along. Uh, and then Elaine Del Bell, um, an ALBA advisor, and she's president of um, the Federation of Latin American and Caribbean Neuroscience Societies. And I think it's great that we really have different continents and very different situations also regarding uh, uh, the pandemic presented here in our discussion group. So they will all get a chance to talk um, in about five to uh, six minutes. So just briefly, I guess most of you know the Alba Network because the advertisement went through the Alba Network, so but please promote it. Um, what we want to do um, is actually promote equity and diversity in brain science um, by sharing best practices to contract bias, um, by recognizing people who have done that in an outstanding way um, to actually uh, recognize science and diversity. Um, to provide networking and mentoring opportunities and to support career development. So the COVID pandemic, I think we're all in it and we thought it might be over in fall, but it's not. Um, uh, but people are getting tired of it. I just told Carmen before that, that right outside my door, um, there are uh, many thousand people protesting for freedom to not wear a face mask and they don't want to keep any of the safety measures. So I think um, it, it will be a hard time and it's difficult also to say when the situation will actually be over. We thought it would be over in summer, now we're fall, it's, it's uh, numbers are rising again. So it's, it's a situation that I think we need to, to really start to uh, maybe adapt to for a longer time period. So, as most of you have experienced, universities, laboratories were closed and also uh, any kind of um, care institution, especially for kids, were closed or operating on very different schedules, making it really hard um, for parents um, to be fully um, focused on work. Um, for a lot of scientists, they had to remote, work remotely um, and postpone a lot of experiment, especially if they work at the bench um, or with human subjects or uh, animal research. Um, parents had to balance professional life and parental duties, which home office sounds nice, but if home office means that you actually also have you supervise your kids for the schoolwork, it, yeah, you, you can guess how much work you can actually uh, get done. Um, and there have been travel bans and there were some very serious situations uh, in some countries um, about students um, being threatened to be um, sort of evicted from the country if they couldn't really go um, in the universities uh, physically, but only online. There were visa restrictions for scientists actually coming into a country for a new postdoc, a new position, a PhD position. Um, so this has put a lot of careers, academic careers at risk. And what I think we see is that the pandemic uh, puts the spotlight on the inequalities that are already existing and maybe amplifying them a bit more, more but also maybe showing us where we need to pay uh, special attention. So um, this is just some facts from some recent publications, one from the Scientific American, but also from a recent paper in Nature, Nature Human Behavior, um, showing that if childcare has had to be taken over, uh, mainly women were doing that. And so sharing parental duties still has not really arrived uh, in our society. Uh, and this has definitely reduced the productivity of women uh, who reported to work um, close to 20% less. And in addition, they were not able to take on new projects. Um, they had little time to collaborate or network. Um, 
they had less articles um, submitted and this reduction in submission was actually only seen in articles um, submitted by women and potentially less grant submissions. And so you can see that this may put uh, careers at risk or slow them down uh, and maybe they get taken over. Um, so this is just some facts about uh, the reduction in publication. I'm sure you can see my mouse here, but you can see that um, in the panel on the, on the left, actually uh, the number of publication with women as first or last authors, the red bar, actually was quite reduced um, between March and April, and is still somewhat reduced uh, in May. So a delay in getting your papers out uh, and, and, uh, and lagging behind in that. So we talked also about the different types of research you can do um, and neuroscience um, and patient clinical research is very much dependent on actually being on site and being able to interact um, with um, the research subject, but also being in the lab. And so there's been a very strong impact uh, on that type of research, a, a special focus of neuroscience. So for wet labs, um, actually, 30 to 40% um, reduction has been reported to pre-pandemic levels. And this is an average. I think some labs were closed down completely and there was no progress going um, on at all. So something delaying um, that again. And as we all know, we try to still connect to each other, connect to our teams, connect to um, uh, different collaborators. Uh, I, I think this have, has worked more or less well, and maybe we can also get um, some insights from, from, from all of you, like what has worked, um, how to actually get team cohesion uh, working, how actually be inclusive, how, how to make sure that every team member um, is part of that sort of online community um, within the team, but are also larger communities. And uh, we also just heard from, from Elaine that especially in countries where maybe the internet connections from home is not that well, um, this can be a problem. So like this move to work from home and be online may work when everything is fine uh, and you have the, the time to do it and also um, the technolo technology to do it. But what if not, what can we, how can we actually uh, help? Um, and of course, all these factors um, influence um, the well-being. Um, of maybe especially women uh, scientists is actually the study that focused on uh, female uh, scientists um, and especially mental well-being. And I think there were a lot of concerns that you can see here, the difficulties in balancing work and home life, um, being concerned about their own health, but actually also having increased family strain um, and actually feeling um, that working from home is difficulty, uh, difficult logistically. So a lot of factors that like on top of sort of, sort of negatively influencing the work output also de decreases mental well-being that again reduces productivity. So that's the situation, at least a short summary of some aspects of the situation from some publications that are outside. And this is all if you want to access that in for the, the, these papers uh, and this information that's on the other website. So can, you can find all of these, uh, these papers listed very nicely. Um, the great work by the office here. Uh, but that's another question that we would like to discuss um, um, later, like what actions are needed. Um, so one thing is from funding bodies to really acknowledge that there has been a delay in productivity and that there need extensions need to be offered um, and some sort of balancing um, of the difficult situation needs to be offered. Uh, and also when we look into our own institutions for um, hiring committees and academic departments to really make sure that we, we, we don't take the easiest solution for hiring now just because it's become difficult um, within the COVID pandemic maybe to hire uh, from other parts um, of, the, of the globe. Uh, and this is more difficult, but um, to, to really have an eye on that. And then also how um, the, our institutions can actually support caregivers and early career scientists. And this could be supplemental funding, more flexible hours, um, childcare policies, um, extension of review periods for tenure or promotions, um, 
making sure that the virtual network uh, opportunities are actually embraced by the whole department, for example, so that it, it, it's a given that you can access all the information virtually also. Um, and maybe we can think of some initiatives that could be developed um, to increase uh, or keep diversity, increase inclusion and equity. And so I would like to thank you for listening to this brief presentation uh, and now switch over so that we can see each other again uh, and maybe ask the, the panel members um, to give a bit of their personal um, views on the topic experiences, but also advices. And maybe I'll just go around uh, in the way I see people on the screen with Carmen, uh, starting with Carmen, maybe then Elaine and then Diane. Yes, very good. Uh, I also would like to welcome everyone to this uh, session. I think uh, it's uh, great uh, to have uh, interest and it will be also great uh, that all the participants participate also with questions, etc. So uh, in uh, preparing maybe what to share uh, with uh, everyone here today, I, I was thinking what to say about the, the COVID situation. Eh? Because if uh, somebody asks us uh, how did you cope and what, how did you organize the lab, etc. My first uh, maybe reaction is to ask when, because there's been so many different phases and uh, we had to be adapting to many different phases. And, and somehow, indeed, if we say uh, we had to uh, adapt uh, to a new situation in which we had to uh, sacrifice many animals, for example, stop the research during the lockdown, etc. And this was indeed a like the crisis uh, phase, when it was maybe very dramatic because everyone had to, to stay from home and we had to reinvent uh, how we interacted as, uh, as teams and also how we could save as much as possible our, our research. I think it was quite stressful because there were so many things to, to deal with. Eh? There was a moment uh, when I was thinking it will be easy because uh, all the traveling is uh, finished at the moment and so there will be much more time now to do things but the reality is that uh, I think as uh, everyone experienced uh, there was no more time there were many Zoom meetings and many things to organize just that things didn't collapse so it was working a lot and not too advanced which uh, I think uh, for somebody working in a stress research uh, this is a, a perfect model of strength because you work and you don't advance and that was a bit uh, tricky eventually i think uh, one finds a way and we found the, the ways to keep going etc but somehow this is something that i consider it's the, the lockdown time the crisis time it was like the challenge to to test our capability to adapt right? to show flexibility and to adapt to to this kind of crisis etc and right now i think we are in a different uh, phase I think uh, we are in a phase which is uh, maybe the second wave is coming, at least in, in Europe, and I think it's not better anywhere else. Then. And um, now it's a kind of a maintained uncertainty. So it's uh, now the time when we have to endure. And uh, I think uh, indeed we cannot just maybe rely on whatever we put together during the crisis uh, to, to cope and to get organized indeed, because now the teams are back in the lab, etc. And I think indeed the uh, people are expecting or were expecting that things would get better and uh, would resume, but it, it didn't happen. So now we have a, a second phase and I think it's a very challenging and difficult and critical time now on how to deal with uh, every lab member because again the, the uncertainty is what could it happen now we hear from the politicians that uh, there will not be again lockdowns and maybe our animal facilities and universities are better prepared uh, for whatever could happen if uh, there are more local lockdowns or more general lockdowns etc but still i think uh, the uncertainties there are very challenging for from a psychological point of view and also from a productivity point of view so i think uh, i we should acknowledge that it's a different phase and i think from my point of view because I, I maybe I'm not so optimistic, always optimistic, maybe that's why I'm interested in the field of anxiety. 
uh, I we don't know what's the future. Eh? Like uh, we are promised that there will be magical vaccines coming and many are under development, etc. And it's true. It might be that everything resumes and then it's wonderful. But it might be that we have to face uh, even worse challenges than what we had until now because of the uh, um, uh, longer period and also maybe um, disappointments and who knows what challenges. So I think uh, somehow from my point of view, I think uh, still we need to acknowledge that this might go for a long time. And I, I didn't get to the formula, but I think we have to really find meaning somehow of uh, how we interact and what are important milestones uh, because otherwise it's too much uncertainty and I think it's also very important uh, to, be, to be careful that we don't stretch uh, ourselves too much and also don't stretch lab members uh, because this might go for a long time so we need to I think uh, create uh, endurance and strength and uh, also I think yeah this type of uh, interactions could be good ones to share maybe ideas etc and uh, find other ways uh, to cope and also to have uh, rewarding situations because uh, we were used to uh, to meet and uh, have good times uh, in conferences. We would be now in Vienna or we would be uh, getting invitations uh, to, to seminars, to talks here and there. All of a sudden, all that uh, is um, finished uh, at the moment or delayed. And I think we experience all of us relief that uh, we don't have to travel so much and uh, maybe our life uh, got uh, more orderly in some way. But uh, I think uh, also life has some peaks of excitement and now it's a little bit more flat. And I think uh, it's uh, another way of living. So I think for me, indeed acknowledging that there are all these different phases and that we still maybe need to be creative on how we uh, build up for the future, it's uh, maybe an important comment from my side. And I would be very interested in hearing uh, what uh, the other panelists and uh, the participants uh, think and are doing. Okay, thank you, Carmen. Uh, Elaine, do you want to continue? You're still on mute. Now it's okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, it's very nice to have this opportunity to speak about uh, ourselves and the experience we, that we have. No, Okay, like Carmen, in the beginning I thought, well, that is the opportunity to be at home, to write everything I need to do, to write and to have more time for myself, you know, to look my father and family and things like that. I don't have a small uh, children now, but I have father that need to be, uh, we need to be care. But uh, 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 it was really bad, you know, to have the students, the, the labs are in Brazil now, the university is closed, no students uh, uh, there and nobody uh, for uh, to postgraduate or PhD students working in the labs, okay? Everybody's at home. Uh, well, many, many people just think uh, there is no danger, so they are uh, uh, abusing, they are doing things that they suppose not to do. So uh, uh, at this moment, we have more than 130,000 of uh, uh, death for COVID, so it's not easy. No, not many tests and uh, not, uh, uh, like I say, the, 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 the responsibles, the, the president or the power people just giving good instructions or good, good information about how to behave and how, what to do. So, uh, uh, I believe there is a, 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 a big problem because uh, uh, there is no perspective, there is not uh, many, many hope. So uh, the stress is bigger, uh, Carmen, and uh, we feel really, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's really strange. We work a lot, and, uh, but uh, uh, there is no, we don't produce too much. Anyway, uh, we meet uh, with the students uh, uh, every one or two weeks, and uh, but they are really scared. 
most of them doesn't want to go back to the lab. We have no, uh, we work my lab with animals, but uh, there is no production of animals. Uh, um, and uh, I, I thought, uh, well, maybe we can uh, write reviews, we can see results, we can, you know, but uh, it's not happening. It's not happening, and uh, it's difficult to 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 know what to do. I I uh, with Alba and with all of you. I believe it is nice to have uh, ideas, to have inspiration, to think about uh, how to behave, what to do, and uh, how to to make uh, how our efforts can be uh, directed to young people in order to make them uh, stronger and to, to, to make uh, them able to, uh, to deal with the, those conditions, okay? Because in some ways, we are full professors, we have a job and we have a salary. But uh, what is going to happen with these students that need uh, to have opportunity for, uh, you know, for a postdoc or to, to, to have a, a job or things like that? Uh, what to do? Uh, uh, yesterday we were talking with uh, somebody that uh, is very old but very uh, uh, wise and he was telling us about uh, to do whatever we can with young people, uh, you know, to, to have uh, small meetings with them, to, 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 to give uh, not just uh, for uh, undergraduate but really uh, 10 years, 14 uh, teenagers, you know, and just talk with them because it would be very good. It's like a, a tutorial uh, uh, experience, you know, with uh, these young people and try to make, to, to make them feel more confident. And, uh, but let's see. <laughs> and I think this kind of panel is really important for all of us, okay? Thank you, Elaine. Uh Diane? Yeah, thanks, Elaine. Um, maybe I'll just bridge from your comments about um, our responsibilities to really thinking about the, this generation of, of kind of early career stage scientists who, um, you know, that's part of our incredible responsibility to, to really make sure that they're um, empowered and enabled to kind of continue uh, to do really wonderful, better things than we ever did. Like, I mean, I think that's got to be our goal. Um, so I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, what I would say is the following that there's, um, I, I actually personally feel incredibly privileged even though you all see the numbers in the United States to be the worst in the world, um, it's incredibly uneven. And, um, you know, uh, I don't have any wood around me. I'm actually outside, but um, you touch wood. <laughs> like I, everything, you know, we, we really are getting, I personally get good health care. I'm at a very um, well-resourced university. Everyone is feeling the financial crisis. We're all under budget constraints. Um, but um, I personally um, get tested once a week through the university. And so um, I, I really do feel that, um, you know, that we're in this kind of bubble of privilege. Um, my lab was taken down for a long time. It was very difficult in terms of research. But I think having heard Elaine and knowing how difficult it is uh, across the world um, and, and um, other parts of the of the globe really being um, affected just really, really, really um, uh, in, in extreme ways by this pandemic. Uh, I wonder whether, you know, we can all start to think about how, um, you know, our relative stability um, and our relative privilege here in terms of like having good access to healthcare, having support from our universities, um, are there ways to, to, to empower others um, and to give others, you know, the ideas and the possibilities? And I think, you know, what Elaine said was, um, you know, are there opportunities now, you know, where, where early stage scientists can actually access people from across the globe, which otherwise would be really difficult, right? So we're all able to use Zoom now, even the, the, the more older folks, <laughs> 
more senior folks than scientists, uh, senior scientists. And so there's this, this, I don't want to suggest we're not under really awful pressure right now, but perhaps adding to this conversation, um, what, what can we do? What can we do to help? And I'd love to hear from the participants about that. But I might just throw out some ideas. So one is, again, we, um, have extensions. All of our graduate students can apply for six month extensions during this period. They just have to provide some, some logic around that. Faculty will get extensions because um, everyone who's under some time limitation applying for grants, people are getting extensions now. So I think that this should be known to, to the global community. And if you're not, um, if that hasn't already happened where you are, maybe you know we can help in providing links and things and and policies that that exist elsewhere these seem to be really critically important and one shouldn't have to do much justification this is a very stressful time uh, we're all brain scientists we know how stress affects your ability to be able to function like it, it's it's really devastating and then when you're taking care of someone younger siblings older parents your own children this is really, really difficult. Um, so, so that would be one. The other would be, we're all, you know, generating content and that content, um, you know, is available, should be available. So are there ways to think about, um, you know, providing content that's being generated um, to uh, the global community? Um, let, let's think a little bit more about that. Uh, the other would be um, to really um, in, uh, empower the, the younger folks, but, but also everyone across the globe. You can actually do something. So you could start to invite people that you would never in a million years be able to convince them to fly across the globe to give a talk. But everyone's giving talks on Zoom now, and it's actually super fun. Um, and so I wouldn't hesitate in making and putting out those invitations um because it's really an opportunity not just for you but also for the speaker like it's fun it's fun to do this um and to and to really get to know another community of scientists and so again not to be uh, naive about the situation which is really dreadful but it is a global situation it's a pandemic um and everyone is experiencing this in different ways and in different ways um but i think the privilege of of us which I count myself in that, really have some responsibility to the global community to start to think about what can we do um, on a bigger scale. And I would just say, <laughs> finally, um, you know, I, I personally, I think I don't think I've taken a day off since mid <laughs> March and just like everybody else, like I thought, oh, I'm going to have a lot of time. But, 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 you know, when you're, when you're directing something or leading something, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of anxiety about making decisions for the group that would normally be able to make decisions, and so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, support that's needed. And I think Elaine mentioned that too. So while we try and deal with our own individual things <laughs> and how everything's affecting us, we do have to give out to the community and begin to think, yes, okay, like I have a role here in order to be able to stabilize, you know, a group around me um, and, to, and to tell them it's okay and here's what you can do and here's how, you know, we can make the best of a very, very, very challenging and, and, and quite distressing situation um, of which there, it's not just COVID <laughs> right now in the United States, as you all know. Okay, so that's, that's it. Um, but lovely to be here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, well, thanks a lot to all of you. I think there were some 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 really great uh, thoughts, and um, I I would like to invite um, any questions from uh, everybody attending, a sharing your own experience, or maybe um, highlighting what you what what you would think would be important, um, and how Alba may may be able to support that. So you can definitely unmute yourself. Um, Put your camera on if you want to join the discussion. So while while we hello, yeah. Hi, this is Hilal Lashwal from the EPFL. Hi. 
Uh, I just wanted to bring a couple issues. Um, you know, so far, you know, most of these discussions on the impact of COVID-19 uh, pandemic continue to be focused on how this impacts us more at the individual level, whether it's uh, as faculty or as research groups and how it affects our productivity. I just want to, you know, sort of put the spotlight on two issues that I feel tend to receive less attention, which is, you know, the looking at it from the perspective of a community. And that is, you know, what we could work together as a community, either within our local communities or as a scientific community at home, to develop some grassroots community-based initiative to support each other, because I think this is the problem now is many groups and many scientists are trying to deal with these issues on their own. And uh, while it's very good to, to share experiences and we learn from each other, I think there is a, it's time perhaps we move into the next level and see what, what we can do, because the, not everyone is affected the same way. Uh, by this. And the second aspect, you know, you know, there are young faculty who are affected more, there are women faculty who have children who will, who will be affected more and they're, you know, feeling the pressure of productivity. At the same time, there are senior faculty and faculty who are, you know, fortunate to not to be subjected to all these pressures. And I personally believe that those, you know, who are lucky should step up you know, to lift some of the weight off the shoulders of the younger faculty and those who are disproportionately affected by the problem, whether it's to help with in, in teaching, whether assuming some committee responsibilities, reviewing grant and checking on them regularly and making sure that, you know, that they are accessible to the young people to help them. So I think if, you know, there is a need to begin to think about is how to put either model initiatives or to effect change at a system level, because the pressure at the level of university and academia, it's still there, you know, to produce the expectation that you have a lot of papers, the, uh, you know, the incentive and reward uh, system in the university hasn't changed in response to anything in, uh, to the pandemic. You know, people are maybe delaying time for submitting your file, delaying, but, you know, when it comes to the expectations, I don't think they haven't changed. And we haven't had an open and honest discussion in, in, in university campuses about these issues. The second aspect that I feel is neglected is, is, is the question of mental health. You know, mental health is a, has been a... Pro you know, all the surveys have shown at the level of the students, it's around 40% even before the pandemic, before all of this disruption in education and research, research and personal lives comes in. So the problem is only worse under the current circumstances. And when it comes to scientists and faculty, this concept of mental health is not even discussed, right? It's not uh, it, it's it's in, in many places is not even acknowledged and we just heard about some of these issues right now and uh, you know there isn't a support system you know for faculty to deal with these issues there isn't an open discussion about the issue because uh, you know for many reasons because I think universities in my opinion are scared to deal with it because the change that they would have to do you know, would require quite a lot of time and financial investments and rethinking at a conceptual level how we evaluate, recognize, and reward people. So I think, you know, my, my, I want to just end in saying that I think it, it's, you know, this is truly beneficial and listening to people experience has been, uh, I would say, therapeutic for most of us. But I think if we want to sort of have a a major impact, we need to begin to think about how to make changes at the level of the community and the system level, and how can we be an act and a sort of agent of change or catalyst to bring about that change. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot um, for the comment. Any of the panel members want to say something uh, to that, Diane? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think your points are extremely um, um, uh, centered on kind of critical aspects. And I think that was part of um, 
overlapping with some of my comments, which is, I, I agree, you know, we, it, but it's inevitable. People struggle to address what was a very sudden change in the way in which we had to do things. And so you look inward and then you have to start looking outward. And I think that's uh, completely right. And that those of us, as I said, who are privileged and who are in environments where, you know, we have very low healthcare threats to us because of the um, the policies that have been put in place. And I would just speak for my own university. I think we've been unbelievably um, open um, and have discussions weekly, if not um, more than that, from the lead, leading administration about all of these uh, challenges that the whole community is facing. But it's uneven. Um, and it, it is time for um, that, that to be communicated so that others can use it as leverage w within their own environment. Um, but it can be very difficult, you know, like some, uh, you know, I, I think it's very difficult to imagine what a global community and a global um, uh, uh, action would be. But um, I think the essence of what you're saying is that these, the, the ways in which people are dealing with it and acknowledgement of mental health issues, the stress that, the, I mean, even daily stress is just completely and totally disruptive to thinking. We know that. <laughs> we all know that, We're, you know. So how do you, how do you provide that, put that out into the community so that others who have less power within the environment that they exist can point to that and say, look, this was just published in eLife by this group of, um, of communities. And if you want to stay up with the times, um, and, you know, and be a real aggressive, um, you know, up to date research university, we need to invoke these changes too. So you can't do it alone. And I think that's probably what you're the essence of what you're saying. And I think that that's completely right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's what we also said, where, where Alba can actually provide all these up to date information. Um, and so that it's easy uh, for everybody to access them and uh, Carmen, you are muted. Yes, uh, no, I, I agree totally. And uh, there is also a comment uh, by Jacqueline. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe you saw it, uh, and it's a very valid one. I think it's very important, and that's uh, something that uh, indeed we are trying to do in Alba a declaration that uh, puts together where there are issues and what are the solutions so that uh, uh, wherever you are in the globe, if you have issues, you can have uh, this document and show what uh, so many other scientists and universities are agreeing upon. And that's something that uh, I hope we will be able not to launch uh, probably uh, in uh, January around the SFN uh, winter sessions. Uh, so this is th some of these ideas uh, to have something like that. But I, I, I think I'm taking some uh, inspiration and some of the comments here because indeed uh, 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 we have now this possibility to use the uh, Zoom and then uh, to reach out to other communities uh, that maybe are not so privileged uh, or that somehow maybe have a good fit on the activities that we can offer. And this is something also that within ALBA we want to develop a, a kind of, a, let's say, a mentorship, but I would like it to be even more focused uh, in scientific uh, complementarity something inspired in the Neuromatch uh, uh, approach, uh, that Neuromatch, uh, for those that uh, are not familiar, is a computational neuroscientist that put together maybe professors or experts uh, in a particular aspect uh, with maybe students or people that uh, want to develop uh, skills and knowledge and uh, research on that particular uh, angle and aspect, etc. So they do a match. And uh, it's something that uh, I think uh, we will be trying to put together within Alba soon in the future, so that uh, eventually, uh, I, I don't know, in our lab we could maybe offer expertise on stress or motivation or metabolism, etc. And then with the very good keyboards we could match and then have uh, working groups, etc. Something else that we could be doing now if really there are labs uh, uh, like in Brazil and other places where you don't have the possibility to, to advance and could be also to put together in this working group, maybe to enrich. You, are, you were talking about writing reviews, but uh, there might be data that needs to be analyzed uh, beyond, etc. I think yeah, by having more resources in this type of uh, actions and, and uh, activities uh, like the Alpha Network, uh, I think one can be very creative and uh, eventually also impactful. And something else I wanted to comment, uh, it's a little bit unrelated, uh, it's uh, regarding uh, 
Hilas uh, proposal that uh, maybe senior faculty are not so um, much uh, burdened uh, and could maybe take over some uh, task uh, by other members. But the reality is that we are already very burdened. Uh, I wish <laughs> that we could take over task uh, by other members. But I think uh, this is uh, indeed uh, something to discuss. Uh, uh, but the reality yeah. is is also not 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 all not all senior faculty are committed as many of the people here. So, mm -hmm. so Perhaps. I think there is room with some to help. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and I think indeed, like we are trying at so many fronts uh, to have maybe role models. Uh, this is maybe one way to uh, incite uh, other faculty to get also more involved uh, than the others. You know, one, one of the other things that a lot of people are impacted is, is that research, their research has slowed down. So one of the things we've done in our lab is, is we've made an open call that, you know, we made all our reagents and tools available. So the idea is that I think maybe what ALPA could do is have a few of the faculty sort of promote this idea of sharing and open uh, resources and and being proactive and letting people know that you're willing to share because it takes a lot of time for people to to generate and many times we spend a lot of time reinventing the wheels and plasmids and things so you know such promoting that practice of sharing resources or expertise could be you know could help many of these groups uh, you know that are affected to catch up in terms of whether it's a grant or finishing a paper or things like that Okay, Elaine, and I think Diane then had a comment. Yes, I, I want to say that uh, at least this pandemic, pandemic thing, this virus, this stupid situation uh, made us to speak about that, okay? Uh, even I, 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 I'm living in Sao Paulo state, in a city that I am uh, almost, I am protected with the things. I, I didn't have, uh, I, I wasn't aware enough of uh, all the things that are happening here, okay? So at least, uh, look, we are speaking about that. Alba is, is, is made, uh, is doing this, let's say, propaganda about, uh, you know, we need to be crea creative, we need to have ideas, we need to be solidary. Uh, we have uh, solidarity with uh, another people. And that's for me, is wonderful, okay? Even uh, my attitude with my students and uh, and so on, okay? So I, I believe that is uh, a beginning. I don't have any illusion. Uh, uh, inequality always happen and uh, uh, nobody's guilt because it was born in US or Switzerland or Germany. It, there is nothing about that. It's just, you know, we are having the opportunity to talk about that. And for me, it's essential, <laughs> okay? It's okay. Thank you. Diane? Um, I, I have a couple of other comments, but I just wanted, uh, perhaps I'll just defer to see if there are any questions and then maybe if we have some wrap up comments, I'll make it then. So just to get other people involved. And then if not, then I'll jump in. Yeah. I, I just, I'm Samatina, hello. I just have a, a, quest, a question. It's not a question, it's a comment actually, because I agree with uh, all the speakers so far. It's really important to have people uh, to discuss these things. And uh, it's important also in a very substantial way for the morale, because it's, um, it makes you feel that other people understand the situation. And uh, if they believe in you also as a young, let's say that um, your supervisor believes in you, your mentor believes in you, then you also have the, the strength to go further with the, this within this stressful time. Because especially for, I can speak for myself, that have young kids, it was really a stressful situation. And on one hand, we don't want another lockdown because it was a bit traumatic. On the other hand, it's also traumatic when you go out and you know that in our canton there are so many cases and you know that it's inevitable to come close with somebody that will have the problem maybe. So it's a stressful situation with a lot of uncertainty. So it's important to acknowledge this as uh, Elaine said and uh, Diane said and Carmen as well. 
And I think that uh, from our point of view, the morale is really important. So if you have people that say, yes, we can do this, we, we believe in you or uh, things will, we have to work and this will pass and be flexible about it. I think this is very important and it can lead also to more specific uh, actions. And, uh, and if we talk about it, for sure, we will have ideas of what to do in more specific ways. And we have to engage, I mean, people that think about that, they have to engage in these things. I think. Okay, great, thank you. So Michaela, I'm seeing uh, you raised your virtual hand. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So first of all, it's very nice to be able to see and talk to you again because I know several uh, of you and we have not talked for a while. Um, along this, I'd like to contribute two things. Um, Given the circumstances that a lot of things have gone online, also in terms of conferences, we, we just had the experience of fans or workshops or webinars that go online. I think this could be a very good opportunity for underfunded countries, uh, also serving the purpose of ALBA as well uh, for inclusion, because this gives an opportunity to underfunded countries to actually participate in events because they have no travel costs, they have no housing costs, they would have only a, a registration cost, if any. So I, I think it would be a, a good initiative to uh, tailor some events towards also these people, uh, still including maybe some discounts or thinking that um, this will be an opportunity for researchers that otherwise would not have been able to take part in events now to, to be an active part of uh, the scientific community. Um, that's the one thing. And the second, uh, I'm sure you uh, have much more experience, uh, but I would just like to share the experience we had this year uh, with our students. So this semester uh, in our university in uh, Ioannina in Greece, uh, we went completely online. Uh, so the summer semester did not take place at all. And uh, when we did the evaluations, uh, we had three or four questions for our students to answer, uh, addressing the same thing. Were you happier or less happy with doing things online? And it was quite surprising to us that um, we had a sample of 600 students, biology students, and um, it was even a preference to online teaching and online learning. We were not really expecting this, um, but under no circumstances, they were unhappy with that. So this maybe uh, could be something that one should think of implementing. For instance, uh, having some pre-recording lectures that would go along to uh, live classes or somehow implementing this ability of meeting through Zoom or Google Meet or uh, stuff like this. So I just want to share these two uh, experiences we, we had here this semester. Yeah, great comment. Just um, a brief comment on that. Um, like there is the worldwide neuro online, which is, I think, uh, neuro talks that happen at least once or twice a week uh, that can be joined by everybody sort of already showing that like there, there has been changes in our minds, how easily we accept that possibilities. And I agree with you. So for example, for the International Society for Psychiatric Genetics, we moved to a virtual meeting and made registration for free for all the World Bank B and C countries. And we've never had such a high attendance um, from researchers from these countries. And that's why we think we will keep at least a hybrid version of the meeting to really stay inclusive and then make the content more available. Yes, uh, and uh, thanks. Uh, of course, we couldn't make it uh, all of the sudden because it was very advanced uh, for free for uh, everyone uh, uh, from different countries. But we could um, attract uh, the funds uh, with, within Alba and with partners, with FK Mini and with Young Iglo, uh, to offer 500 grants uh, for uh, countries of low and medium middle economic uh, situations. Uh, and I, they were very happy and so on. Something that I think uh, maybe it's very good to have access to the conferences if you are maybe uh, somewhere else and not easy to get access to these conferences, etc. I think it would be very nice to go a bit beyond that and, and create the uh, discussion groups, etc. So that uh, all the networking part um, can be recovered a little bit. So I, I think this is something we have to work in. Mm. 
that it's not only giving accessibility, but also creating some discussions and uh, follow up uh, with people. So I'm actually not sure how much time we had allocated. Do we have one hour or? Yeah, so maybe it's time that we start maybe about like either some uh, questions. Um, here there's uh, a question from uh, to the panel. Do you have any advice for viewers on how to approach universities or departments to implement new actions or policies post COVID-19? Um, how to do that? Diane? You muted yourself. Um, oh, yeah. So um, number one, there's power in numbers. <laughs> um, whether you're singing, <laughs> volume can <laughs> hide imperfections or, um, you know, so I so I think that's number one. Um, number two, to make the argument really compelling and there's there is a lot of information on the yeah. website and we as carmen mentioned i think you know we again coming back to our responsibility i think there's resources that we could point to and i'd say number three think about who the audience is and what they care about and if you're really making the argument to universities or you know whoever it is but let's say you're thinking about promotion um, and looking for extension for a faculty member there's an economic, a really simple economic argument here. You know, we put in a lot of um, energy and resources into um, our um, faculty colleagues. I was, we all were, you know, we were all starting out at some point. The last thing you want to do is, is to have someone just not be able to make it because of this pandemic, which is real. We're all scientists. And so you lose a huge amount as a university by not <laughs> acknowledging the problem that we're under right now and not providing an extension. So the economic argument, the power of numbers, and then, and then showing what other places do that perhaps your university is aspiring to be. Like that, th these are all, I think that they're the three things that become important and provide a solution. So when I, mm. when I go with arguments and say, look, like this, this needs to be done. But here's here's a set of guidelines around what we're looking for. Number one, number two, number three. It's much easier for a university or administration to say, well, we agree with number one and two, but three is a problem, rather than kind of create a policy. So provide a policy, provide a draft, say what you're looking for, and also think about how that gets financed, but point to the economic argument, which is a real economic argument. It's like, what are you gonna do if you lose us? Now you're gonna have to hire someone else. Now you're gonna have to train them. For graduate students, it's the same thing. Give graduate students an extension. It would be insane <laughs> to just get to the end and they haven't quite made it and they haven't quite got that in because of the pandemic. So I, that's what I would say. Great, thank you. Any other comments, Elaine? Yeah. Uh, uh, even in a country like uh, I live, you know, the, the agencies that give fellowship for the students, they are uh, giving more time of fellowship, at least six months. E the, the agencies uh, that are giving money to us, they are not uh, paying. But anyway, if you have reports to do, now they start to give more time uh, for you to send the report. I would start with uh, those things, small things. And at least uh, as Diane told, no, you say one or two or three things because uh, uh, it's not time to, to solve all the problems, but you start with uh, small boxes. But everything in boxes is what I try to do, you know. So I go first to this one and next to one and so on. Uh, the important thing is, as somebody told, uh, uh, we can't uh, ha uh, lose the, 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 the hope or we can't stop fight. That's it. Uh, uh, and try, do your best, always. <laughs> Great, thank you. Comment? Yes, no, I think uh, one has to try and I think uh, that's also why we gave the name ALBA. I think uh, things are changing and uh, I think in general universities and uh, governing bodies, etc. are more open and uh, flexible also. And I think uh, 
we have to take the opportunity and that's why Alba is here to catalyze this change. Uh, but I think uh, normally things are possible and there is this uh, new kind of trend. Uh, and I think uh, indeed uh, together we are also um, putting together strength and I think uh, this is uh, what uh, we have to continue doing. But uh, I, I'm, I'm optimistic as well. Also, Elaine commented before that uh, what's going to be the career of, of the students or postdocs because uh, maybe they are not so productive but this happened to everyone at the moment and so i think uh, we have to think that there is a kind of a delay that it's very common so it shouldn't uh, hopefully affect some more than others of course we know that there are inequalities here but uh, we have to identify also these inequalities and see if we can uh, help and put some message let's say uh, yeah, yeah. Things here. Okay, well, thanks to all. Like maybe what I took from these meetings were several points. Like A, I think we can really benefit from our novel experience with, and novel sort of ease of using online communication tools. And I think this can really increase how globally we work together. We have here Europe, we have uh, South America, we have North America, we have uh, Africa, as I far can see. So we're really, like even in this small meeting, we're much more global, I guess, than, than we used to be. Um, so continue that. Um, and like there was one comment also saying like, what do we acknowledge in science and really be aware that especially in these crisis situations, there were people who really worked a lot to make online teaching happening for the students and to how do we as a as a university uh, maybe for our seniors how do we acknowledge this and not just the hard research facts make sure that this also gets um sufficient appraisal and um the, the comment about sharing i think is is very well taken and i think some labs have more data that they can ever analyze maybe that's a, a possibility also to have open data analysis called, look, I have this type of data. Do you want to collaborate with us and analyze this data or ask mm -hmm. this question with our data? And I think this could be something where we, as a community, get more productive and, and grow closer together. And I realized that it's like what has already been done by, by the ALBA team to put information on the website about the facts. And But also, I think now we need to fill in what other uh, universities and other institutions have done to counteract COVID-19 is very important for everybody um, to really make a good argument um, and maybe also see and, and get the checks and balances. Did my institution do everything right? Can I do more? What have others done? So comment on the website, comment via Twitter, that would be great so that we can have more ideas and share uh, with everybody um, what is possible. So with this, thanks again. Um, this is great. And goodbye and have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks. That was great. Bye. Bye.